Hello. Welcome to this webinar offered through Dairy XNet, which is a national e-extension resource. My name is Kathy Lee. I'm an extension educator with Michigan State University, and I'll be today's moderator. Roger Thompson grew up on a dairy farm in southern Michigan. He has been a practicing dairy veterinarian for 35 years, working in Ohio and Michigan. In 1988, Dr. Thompson launched his own all-dairy veterinary practice named Team Management Concepts because he believes strongly in the power of teamwork. During the past 15 years, Dr. Thompson has focused on milk quality as a specialty. Four years ago, he launched his second business called MQIQ Consulting and now spends 95% of his time performing milk quality consulting throughout the U.S. and internationally. Dr. Thompson has created the Teaching Parlor, a one-of-a-kind portable milking system, which he uses to train individuals who are striving to improve their effectiveness as milk quality consultants. Roger, at this time, I turn over the program to you. We look forward to learning about important considerations in the design and analysis of milking systems. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, as we were saying initially, I don't know how much buzz came in, but um, to me, um, the milking system is an important part of the overall analysis of, of any milk, milk or mastitis troubleshooting issue. And today we want to focus on the milking system and some of the uh, newest research that's out there that uh, indicates or tells us the kinds of things that can produce or, uh, or hinder uh, production of milk quality as far as an equipment standpoint. To me, the goals of any milking system are twofold. We want to milk a clean, dry, well-stimulated cow or teat. And we want to do that consistently, quickly, comfortably, and completely, and certainly Point two quickly and point three comfortably of these goals uh, uh, clearly can be in conflict with each other. And with that said, uh, we need to keep that in focus as we um, talk about how to set a parlor up and how to get it to function correctly. The other component of a good milking system is to direct cow flow, where we can let we don't want the parlor to run out of cows. We don't want to mix cows. We want to handle cows gently and humanely. And we don't want to ask the cow to give up more than three hours of her day every 24 hours for the milking event. That's leaving her pen, getting milked, and getting back to her pen. So those are the keys to any milking system from, to me, the overall design standpoint. Uh, reasons to change a milking system or things to think about when you're initially building a new parlor, designing a parlor, we want to improve mastitis control and improve milk quality uh, through the milking system. Uh, we want to improve milking performance, speed, and completeness in milk out. The top two reasons, these last two reasons, are often why I'm invited to a farm to do a, a workup on a parlor. And uh, they, they tend to be the vast majority of the reasons that we're looking at parlors these days and, and equipment. The other four ideas, decrease energy consumption, pump wear, uh, decrease dirt in the regulators and in the vacuum pumps, and aesthetic or cosmetic reasons. Those are all justifiable explanations uh, to review the system design of a parlor or to consider an upgrade. Frequency of evaluation. Small parlors, uh, years ago, you milk a couple hours in the morning, go do your field work, milk a couple hours in the evening. Those kinds of parlors didn't log a lot of hours a year, so an annual complete system evaluation would be effective. Um, modern parlors that are running 12 hours a day, some parlors, a lot of parlors are now running upwards of 24 hours a day. They need uh, an evaluation much more frequently than what we've done in the past. Uh, at a minimum, uh, these busy parlors should have monthly, monthly checks where we are, we're going to be um, monitoring uh, vacuum levels, perform unit drop-off tests, effective in manual reserve if the, the drop-off test fails, regulator efficiency, all these things need to be done. These kinds of evaluations are, are outlined perfectly in the uh, National Mastitis Council Airflow Manual. It's available from their website, nmconline.org. Uh, it is the gold standard for monitoring parlors, and it gives us uh, consistency from uh, person to person coming into the parlor using the right strategies on looking at an, a, a parlor system. Um, and these, if you look at the, the bottom of this slide, Parlors running 24, 24 hours a day are logging probably over 8,000 hours, 8,760 hours if you 
if it never turns off a day or a year, I mean. And you ask a dairyman how many hours he puts on his best tractor or truck, he would say that a couple thousand hours is a lot. So we have to remind our producers that the maintenance on the parlor is very important and easily to neglect. It's easy to neglect, but often overlook it. The three areas in the parlor that have the greatest fatigue or wear considerations would be the regulator or the variable speed drive, the variable frequency drive. That component of the parlor is designed to get us consistent vacuum level throughout the parlor, day in and day out, hour by hour, so the cow experiences a similar feeling every time she comes in and is milk. So those components are critical. Uh, pulsation, pulsator function, point two, very important for the pulsators to be consistent, to not vary uh, too much uh, on a percentage basis from what they're to be set at based on the controller settings. And then, of course, number three, the liner function. Uh, the liners fatigue and wear out. They have a, a mandatory replacement that the manufacturers give on them, uh, manufacturer the, the frequency replacement. And the, of all the milking components of this milking system, the liner is the one part of the milking system that physically touches the cow. So it, it has a big part to play on the overall comfort of the milk out and the uh, comfort of the cow in experiencing the milking event. Some just basic comments here and some other regular maintenance before we get into the systems in general. Regulators. Regulators need to be cleaned very, very frequently. Monthly is a really good strategy for cleaning regulators, especially the air lubricated regulators uh, like the Sentinels. Um, they, they just build up dirt, especially in the summer. We open doors and windows. Dust is coming in. They need to be checked regularly so they will function correctly. Pulsators. They need to be looked at on a consistent basis. Direct Design pulsators, style pulsators, uh, really need a rebuild, a re-kitting every 2,500 hours. The indirect design pulsators every 4,500 hours. You can see this direct-looking pulsator picture of it in the, on the slide. That's bedding material, dry manure solids, and manure that has been sucked up into that pulsator, obviously affecting its ability to function correctly. Other regular maintenance items we need to pay attention to, all the rubber goods, tubes and gaskets, milk hoses, twin air tubes, short pulsation tubes. Six months is really uh, an ideal time to change these. Often these hoses are left um, for long periods of time and not change. Uh, the basement parlors are a great engineering design. It's dry in the basement or subway parlor, but often the hoses are neglected and uh, they can be uh, left in place for months and months, even years, years, and, and that's unacceptable from a cleanliness standpoint and from a performance standpoint. Liners, there's there's just a ton of liners on the market to, to choose from, and they range from 1,200 milkings up to 10,000 milkings as far as the manufacturer's recommendations. One thing to think about on liners is they also are very sensitive to the wash-up chemicals, and so in small herds where we're not milking that many cows on a, on a daily basis, uh, liners may need to be changed more on a on a number of days of use because of the number of washings they see. Um, most, most companies that make rubber goods would tell us that liners really are starting to fatigue, a traditional rubber liner is fatiguing it after it's seen 70 to 90 wash-ups or at a maximum 90 days, which would be two wash-ups a day on a 2X herd. Um, the different materials they're made out of can affect their longevity, silicone liners, silicone milk hoses, um, have a longer lifespan, but again, none of them are permanent. They, they don't last forever, so they do need to be changed at a regular uh, schedule. Here's a slide, a basic design of a milking system. We're going to generate a vacuum, and we're going to do that with some kind of piece of equipment, uh, a vacuum pump of sorts. And we're going to have some pipes that run from wherever the vacuum pump is located to a, a central point, uh, usually some kind of larger tube or tank that uh, other plumbing components can come off of. Um, we used to call them a balance tank, but most equipment people uh, cringe when we call this big tank a, bal a balance tank. It's not balancing anything, but it does usually have a lot of outlets so that the rest of the plumbing is simplified with a distribution tank, a header tank, whatever you want to call it. It used to be made out of steel and with rust and leak. Now most of this the vacuum system is made out of uh, PVC, Schedule 40 PVC pipe, very durable. It can develop leaks in the joints. It must be monitored in that regard. 
but it's much easier to work with than the old steel pipe of decades ago. You're going to have an overhead line that will loop. It will have a crossover at the back end. That's what the pulsators will be connected to to supply the vacuum for the pulsators. And then underneath you see that the milk line uh, makes a loop also. Uh, occasionally you'll see a dead end milk line on a parlor, but in general for wash up purposes, most milk lines will loop and then they will come to a common uh, stainless steel container or vessel that we'll call a receiver jar. Notice that uh, the milk slope, the, the milk line must be sloped because we really aren't sucking milk through the milk system with the vacuum. We're creating a um, a pressure gradient between the teat cistern and outside of the street canal up in the liner. That's that's helping to remove the milk out of the teat. But after that, we really need to allow gravity to work with us and the path of milk from the teat to the milk line and from the milk line to the receiver needs to be downhill. We've got to let um, Mother Nature, let gravity help move the milk. We don't want to lift milk anytime necessary. And then you can see the, the um, red um, square um, rhomboid device object here in, in this picture. That's the vacuum regulator, or that would be the location of the transducer. That would be the, the device that's measuring vacuum and sending a signal to the variable speed drive on the vacuum pump. The regulator or the DFD transducer needs to be as close to the sanitary trap as possible because that's where it w those those devices will recognize a change in the vacuum level and will either reduce the amount of fresh air coming in or increase the amount of fresh air coming in if it's a regulator or change the speed of the vacuum pump if it's part of the VFD system so that we get a steady, steady vacuum. We need a steady vacuum to create a steady claw vacuum, which is ideal for the cow. She can feel uh, significant fluctuations in the claw. Now there's, there's kind of a little debate running in the industry these days uh, amongst some of the researchers um, where uh, we're, we're questioning the, the significance of some claw vacuum fluctuation. Now, massive claw vacuum fluctuation, greater than three inches of fluctuation in the claw itself, I think everyone would agree that that's excessive and the cow can feel that. But lower claw vacuum fluctuations, we used to think that they are going to cause a lot of... Um, of um, uh, risk for mastitis, but uh, Dr. Reinemann, his research at the University of Wisconsin is suggesting that that, that is a minor, minor risk for um, uh, clinical mastitis uh, causing problems in the system. A little bit of claw fluctuation is not a big driver for mastitis risk. So that's a, that's a little bit of a tweak from what we've all thought about for many years, and it, it brings some really robust discussion at NMC meetings lately. Vacuum pumps, many different designs. Typically, you're going to see either vein pump, and you know it's a vein pump because it's got it's going to have an oiler device above it. It's going to have oil dripping into it, and typically a round of, of a vein pump, the floor in the mechanical room is oily. The new low pumps are nice. They're, they last longer. They, they don't physically have any touch wear points. They're two lobed uh, high objects that spin close to each other, creating a vacuum. And more and more, you'll see the lobe type of vacuum pump that... It uh, doesn't require constant oiling. So how about sizing a vacuum pump for a parlor? And there's some rules of thumb here on this slide that can give you a basic idea of whether the vacuum pump is adequate for the system. Um, basic, a basic milking unit will, if you let air in uh, to basic milking unit, that's the claw, the cups, turn it upside down, let air in it, it'll use about 30 to 40 CFMs cubic feet per minute. That's how we're going to measure this vacuum generation that the vacuum pump's doing. Some of the newer upsized milk lines, we're getting three-quarter inch, seven-eighths inch milk, milk lines, which require bigger inlets on the milk, milk line itself. When you open those up, a, a unit of that capacity, now we're lo looking more maybe at 60 CFMs. So now we might, have to, we might have to consider a larger vacuum pump if we upgrade our milk inlet, something that is a good idea on some of these farms that are having um, higher production cows. Uh, we can be seeing some um, more stable vacuums in the claw and more better uh, milk movement away from the cow if we use a bigger um, milk line. So then each milk, milking unit itself on a, 
on a running basis, it's going to have a fresh air inlet that's going to use maybe three-quarters of a CFM. The pulsator is going to use maybe 0.75 CFMs. So two to three CFMs is a good guesstimate of thumb rule for how, many, uh, how much CFMs you need per unit. And then the rule of thumb, a horsepower will generate 10 CFMs. So you can go to a parlor. You can look on the electric um, motor driving the vacuum pump, see how many horses it is. And let's, let's talk through an example, a 10-horse motor. If it generates uh, one, uh, one CFM or 10 CFMs per horsepower, 10 horsepower would generate 100 CFMs. Some of the load pumps aren't exactly that efficient, but um, close to it. And then, so let's uh, say we have a double, a double 10 parlor. That would be 20 units. And we'll use the two CFMs as a thumb roll. And so we're going to say we want to start with 35 CFMs. And we're going to have two CFMs per unit. We've got 20 units. That's 40 CFMs, 40 plus the 35. 75 CFMs would what we need to run that double 10 parlor. And we've got a 10-horse motor that potentially could be generating 100 CFMs. So we should have adequate air for that parlor. Now, there's a drop-off test. There's an effective and manual reserve test that is described in the NMC airflow uh, notebook that um, you would want to apply to this parlor and make sure that we're confirming that our what I call it napkin uh, analysis, is adequate for this parlor. Now, if I had three-quarter inch milk inlets and I got need 60 CFMs as a base start point, then maybe then I would say I need three CFMs instead of two because I've got bigger milk inlets on this double 10. You can see I could quickly need over 100 CFMs and my 10-horse vacuum pump might not be adequate. So this is, this is some things I'm always analyzing when I go to a parlor and and anyone can do this with just these basic thumb rules. Steady vacuum level is critical. I know that we're saying it's not one of the big drivers for clinical mastitis, but most people still are comfortable to say that steady vacuum, that steady claw vacuum of the cow fields is very important, and it does give us a good steady milk out, a comfortable milk out. So we're going to accomplish that either with a regulator, as you see on the right picture. That's an air lubricated sentinel type uh, regulator. And notice its location up to the PVC line, but right at the bottom is a stainless steel pot, and then there's a, a long gooseneck stainless steel tube that goes into the receiver. That pot at the bottom is a sanitary trap. You want your regulator or your transducer for your VFD to be near the sanitary trap, right near the regulator, so it notices vacuum change quickly, not way into the mechanical room or some other place in an attic or outside someplace. Cardinal rules here. Air comes into the system, our vacuum drops, we suck air out, vacuum increases. Dr. Andy Johnson's been preaching this to all of us veterinarians and anybody that wants to listen to him uh, for years. And this really helps when you're digging into a parlor and you're trying to figure out why is the vacuum high or low? What's going on here? Just remember, air in, air out. Testing the system vacuum levels. So the points of testing, if you go into a parlor and you don't see test ports at certain points in the parlor, you know the system has never been tested following the NMC protocols. We want a test port for vacuum levels near the vacuum pump, near the receiver, near the uh, regulator, and then one at the crossover line at the back of the uh, pulsator line between the, the two sides of the pulsator line. So those are the um, rectangles, the red rectangles I have in this picture. That's where we can check vacuum levels and look for consistency. And then when we come in and do an airflow analysis uh, following NMC protocols, we want an airflow gauge and we want to check how many CFMs the airflow or the pump is generating. And then we can use the airflow meter at the receiver to do an effective and manual reserve if we don't have a VFB system. The milk cluster, the part that touches the cow, very important. And this is where uh, Dr. Reinemann is getting a lot of research uh, published and, and is really emphasizing to us you know, that are analyzing systems that the research is telling us that the cluster and how it interacts with the teat, congestion of blood in the teat, and not only at the teat end but ringing and uh, congestion of blood at the base of the teat where the annular ring is anatomically inside of that teat structure. This is where if we are getting a lot of congestion, a lot of chronic swelling in the uh, teat wall we see a significant risk increase for clinical mastitis and cell count. 
Uh, Dr. Reinman showed me some data just a couple weeks ago from one of the Scandinavian countries that showed a strong correlation using ultrasound analysis on uh, milkers, cows that were milked, and, and they had a lot of congestion because of improper settings or high vacuums, whatever it was, that uh, that correlation with ultrasounding the teeth and, and the teeth barrel and seeing tremendous blood congestion for two, four, six hours after the milking event, that those herds, those cows were a significantly increased risk uh, for clinical mastitis. So I'm finding this interesting that we used to think claw vacuum was our, our big criminal, uh, average claw vacuum consistently cutting claw vacuum fluctuation, but now we're being told that the health of the tea, blood congestion in the tea, is even a greater risk <clears throat> for elevated cell counts driven by increased rates of clinical mastitis. Milking claws bottom and load, top and load, all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, a variety of these different designs of claws can all function correctly. Just understand top and loads are, are really designed. Now, you know, I told you earlier, we don't want to lift milk, and here we've engineered certain claws that we lift milk on purpose. The reason that you have a top and loading claw is we acknowledge that we're creating many slugs in a top and load claw. The engineers would say, well, I know how long that slug is going to last, how long it takes to to lift up out of the claw, get into the milk line where the where the slug is eliminated. And so I can control the fluctuation of vacuum in that claw because I'm making steady mini slugs. Um, if you have a bottom and load claw and the, the claw would flood, uh, we could have uh, extended periods, several seconds or longer, where the claw is flooded and, and um, we're getting a significant change in the claw vacuum. So yin and yang, debate on the design of the claw. A variety of different types of claws can work correctly when installed correctly and uh, set up with the right vacuum level. Inflations, um, so many you can check, can't shake a stick at all of them as far as out in the marketplace these days. Shapes, sizes, materials, rubber and silicone uh, combinations, round, triangle, square, oval, narrow, medium, large, taper bores, bended, non-bended. Uh, how do you know what to do? Um, what, what do you recommend? To a, a customer, this this is um, this is a real challenge, and it but it's very important to know. So um, let me just make a couple comments on liners in general. Um, the material they're made out of, um, rubber liners can milk cows comfortably. Silicone can milk a cow comfortably when set up correctly. Um, the shape uh, rounds really match up with the shape of a teat nicely. So one thing you want the teat and the liner to accomplish during the milking event is to seal the teat and the liner together so we get little, if any, vacuum moving around the teat, building up into the mouthpiece uh, chamber of the, of the liner, which creates tremendous strangulation of blood trying to move from the apex of the teat back up into the udder. So um, you want to get a good seal. Round liners uh, do that nicely. Triangles can do it if they, if they aren't exaggerated on the corners. Um, Square liners, we see more ringing with a square liner because it creates four corners where vacuum can sneak around a T. It's the old round peg in a square hole. Um, we have some challenges with those. The oval, oval liner, uh, it's an interesting shape, novel shape. It doesn't really do anything different than the round does. Please understand just a couple facts about liners that I'm convinced are solid truth no matter what type or style of liner we're looking at. Large four liners milk out faster than a medium bore, and a medium bore milks out faster than a narrow bore. That's been true for decades. The reason that large bore liners have lost favor from uh, they were commonly used in the 50s and 60s. I've still got a liner that Dad used when we were milking when I was growing up, and you can almost put your fist in there. That's an exaggeration, but it's a big bore liner, and it was made by International Harvest Store. So everybody was making liners back then. But the thing about a large bore liner is you will do two things. You will create a lot of space for vacuum to sneak around a teat in a large bore liner, especially as the milking event finishes and that teat becomes empty of milk. The vacuum ringing is really phenomenal with a large bore liner. And you will change the physical shape of teats in a herd by milking the entire herd uh, day after day, month after month with large bore liners. You will create large barrel teated cows even though genetically they're not meant that way, but you can stretch the teat skin and create really big handled cows uh, with large bore liners. So most people just only use a large bore liner for uh, in a fresh cow parlor on cows with a lot of edema, and not many people are using a large bore liner for routine milking. 
medium and small narrow bore liners are typically most commonly found in, in modern dairy farms. Now, the narrow bore liner milks slow, the slowest of the three for shape, but the narrow bore liner is beautiful because it reduces the amount of vacuum sneaking around the tea, so it reduces the ringing up at the mouthpiece chamber. So you want a narrow bore liner because it reduces ringing, but you want a large bore liner because it milks the fastest. So where do you find the ideal balance? Well, that's why there's so many products out there on the market and trying to figure out um, uh, how, to, how to overcome those two yin and yangs of what's best. Um, most liners are a medium or a narrow bore liner being used today, and uh, it's kind of trying to find a happy medium between uh, reducing ringing but maximize speed. The shells, they have to marry the liner. The shell and liner are an important combination of, of perfect fit. The liners are made for specific shells. You have to know what shell that liner is designed for because of the stretch in the shell can vary. That affects the overall performance of the liner. Um, some shells have put have notches in them now, so they, they connect with the liner nicely, so we stop the twisting of them, because the big thing with liners is when they twist inside the shell, now you're not going to milk that quarter out, because that liner is twisted like the end of a bread wrapper on a loaf of bread, and nothing's going to happen. So reducing twisting is important. That's always been a, bad, a negative thing about silicone liners, that silicone is super slippery, and it wants to rotate, twist really easily. So that's where silicones are a challenge on twisting. We don't need to add a lot of weight anymore. It used to be we would weight uh, shells, weight the, the, the shell liner combination, right, pull down on them to mean sh machine strip. Uh, you'd hang pieces of metal on there. You'd hang rocks on, on your milker to milk a cow faster. All of those things are taboo now. That's not the way we milk cows quickly. In fact, we're going to more lightweight plastic shells, lighter weight liners and claws because they can milk out just fine that way. There's other ways to milk a cow quickly other than hanging weight on the liner or shell. Shutoffs, uh, these are for your automatic cluster removal systems. They can be um, something simple like this picture. It can be uh, part of the meter system you have for measuring the milk and shutting it off. Some meters don't have their own shutoff, so you have a meter and then you'll have a shutoff like this right past the meter between there and the milk line. And then there's some parts of the country where they have um, uh, gotten tired with trying to maintain some of all of these electronic pieces of the milking system, and they've gone to simply manual pinch valves on the milk line, which if you have your milkers trained, I'm not advocating for this, but if you have your milkers well-trained and you pay attention to what they're doing in the parlor, I've seen some decent results where they are going back to old school and manually detaching the milkers. And that's a visual decision by the, by the milker, and they'll walk up and pinch a valve on the milk line to stop the vacuum, not just pull the unit off under vacuum, but stop the vacuum, and then detach, take the unit off by hand, and hang it on a hook. So all different ways that we can get um, cluster removal. It just needs to be done at the correct time. As Dr. Reinemann mentioned to me two weeks ago, and I think this is a good analysis, he said, in the U.S. over the past two decades, we've had a nationwide experiment of milking cows wetter and wetter because there was a period of time that we thought if you left any milk on a cow when she left the parlor, she would have an increased risk of mastitis. And then we realized we're doing a lot of damage to teat, teat ends, a lot of discomfort by that much dry milking. So we've been working towards a wetter takeoff setting, having a few squirts of milk in every cow at detach. And to this point, uh, we've not found uh, any point where we've moved too far towards leaving a little milk into the cow when she goes back to the pen in regards to the increased risk of clinical mastitis. And Dr. Reinemann said he's got a couple of grad students right now working on uh, how wet can we make them and still not increase the risk of mastitis. We want to sell the milk, so from a production standpoint, we don't want a lot of milk to go back to the pen. But um, dry milk, drying them, uh, milking them very dry is not what we want to do. So the goal of pulsators is to alternate between fresh air, atmospheric air, and vacuum air into the pulsation chamber. That's the space between the liner and the inside of the shell. And by alternating that, if it's vacuum inside of the liner where the teat is, that's constant vacuum. If we vacuumize the pulsation chamber, then the liner will assume its normal shape as the picture on the left that depicts. So the liner has vacuum both inside and outside of it, and it will just assume its normal shape, and that's where we have the milking event. Unlike hand milking, where when you squeeze the teat, the milk comes out, with the automatic milkers, it's the opposite. You open up the liner and the milk comes out. 
And then the right picture here, the heat um, is, um, has the fresh air comes into the pulsation chamber, the vacuum inside the liner where the teat is sucks or collapses the liner down, pulls it closed, and this is where we get a massage or rest phase. So on the left is the B phase, the milk phase, open phase, and on the right is the massage or rest phase. And the pulsator alternates between fresh air and vacuum. And here's a picture of a, an indirect pulsator. There's a, there's a plunger inside. <clears throat> there's a coil uh, in the top part of this, of this uh, pulsator picture on the right. You can see the atmospheric air is coming into that tube on the top. And the pulsator is literally mounted on a vacuum line, so it can pull vacuum up through the bottom. So when the plunger is pulled up, as the D-phase shows here, we vacuumize the pulsation chamber. The liner assumes its normal dimensions open, and milk is coming out. And this next point is the electrical current is turned off to the coil. The, and the plunger drops down, is pulled down by vacuum against the inside of the pulsator, and fresh air sneaks around it. And now we have the rest phase. And the pulsator does this thousands of times. Typically, most pulsators have been set uh, these days at 60 pulses a minute. That's 60 up and downs a minute, just clicking away all the time. Here's a graph. This is a, a tri-scan graph. There's several different testing equipments that we're using to, um, <clears throat> to graph pulsators. And you can see up at the very top of, of this uh, of this graph, or of these, uh, of this data, that uh, we have two channels functioning. Most pulsators now have a two channels, not a single channel, where all cups fire at the same time. They alternate, and it can be left or left and right, or it can be uh, uh, front and back. And then um, you can see on uh, these that we have a rate of about 62. The decimal points, 0 0.33, 0 0.4. Um, those are just. Um, subtle artifacts from the tri-scan evaluating what we're doing here. So we would say that's a rate of 62, and the ratio is the time division between the uh, top and bottom of the um, of the graph. A and B is the opening. A is the opening of the liner. B is the open phase. C is the closing of the liner, and D is the closed or massage phase. You can see with the tri-scan, down at the bottom, A plus B phase is 65% of the time. C plus D phase is 35% that's what the ratio does. The ratio divides how much time we spend opening and have the liner open versus closed and closed. At a rate of 60 pulses per minute, you're going to end up with a total number of milliseconds here of about 1,000. It should be 1,000 milliseconds if you're pulsing at 60. At 62, you're going to have a little less than 1,000 milliseconds that you divide by 65.35. And then you see a vacuum level here. That's the vacuum that is in the, uh, the uh, pulsation line pulsator vacuum line uh, in the tri-scan shows that. And then at the very bottom is the graphical uh, image of what these numbers all look like uh, at the top. And here's just a, a close-up of these graphs to show you the A phase is opening. So the horizontal bars on this tri-scan graph, every bar is two inches of vacuum. So we're up here in the over 12 inches of vacuum in the pulsation chamber. And then uh, this is moving at... Uh, at 0.25 seconds per uh, vertical line, so it moves very quickly. So you can see these graphs. And there's uh, each channel is, is represented here. So one of the darker line is one channel, and then the lighter line is the other channel. So it opens and closes. You can see the A phase is the opening of the liner. The B phase is while it's open. The C phase is the closing of the liner. The D phase is closed. The A and C phases really have everything to do about the equipment. That's the liner and shell combination of the link of your twin air tubes, the pulsators you're using. Um, all of those components that are the physical part of your milking unit have an impact on your A and C phases. The B and D phases are significantly influenced uh, by the settings, the rate and ratio. That's what <clears throat> the cow feels. So that's, it seems like a silly, maybe uh, detailed analysis to say, well, let's just say the liner's open or closed. Why do we care about the opening and closing event of the liner? Well, it varies from, from liner to liner, shell to shell, and all these other things. So. Tearing it apart in four phases is important when it comes to uh, analyzing some pulsation. Then steady vacuum level is critical. We've talked about this at the very beginning. And these three tests to evaluate airflow, I've talked about in the unit drop-off test. The rule of thumb has been if you have less, 30, less than 32 units in a parlor, uh, that the uh, milking system 
should be able to handle a unit being opened up, letting air into one milking unit turned upside down, and that the, the vacuum system, the vacuum level in that, in that part of the system would not drop more than 0.6 inches. Why do you say, well, 0.6, that's an odd number. Well, it's 2 kPa, so obviously the rest of the world with their metrics went out on this one. And so 2 kPa, 0.6, that's the maximum we want to drop. And then when you close that unit and you watch the system vacuum again, you don't want it to overshoot more than 0.6 and then come back down to your starting point again. That's all really dictated by uh, your regulator or your variable frequency drive, the, the transducer there. That equipment is responsible for handling an unexpected air input. Uh, then if it fails the drop-off test, so I said uh, a system less than 32 units should be able to handle a single unit drop-off. More than 32 milking units, uh, NMC would suggest it should be able to handle two units opening up at the same time. But there's a caveat, caveat on that, very important. On smaller parlors under 32 units, if you've got two milkers or some parlors, might even have three milkers in a smaller parlor for some reason, um, then you could have two milkers attaching units at the same time or a milker attaching and unit kicked off. So if you've got more than a single milker in a parlor on these smaller parlors, I, I say, and a lot of people are also suggesting, that, that a unit, that, that parlor needs to be able to handle a two-unit drop-off test because we have a lot of milkers functioning. And I think that's a legitimate um, a statement there. Then uh, if it fails the drop-off test based on NMC standards, the effective reserve is an airflow test that we do at the receiver. And if it's, then if it, has a, um, if it has a regulator, not a VFD drive, then the manual reserve is the last test we would do. And um, that would check the uh, efficacy, the efficiency of the regulator itself. So these are really good tests, airflow tests. Um, I can tell you I've been doing a lot of work with some dealers, equipment dealers. And they're, you know, they're all hardworking people out there trying to keep milking systems established. And I, I um, admire all of them for their work. They're, they're out doing emergencies, kind of like us veterinarians running around treating sick cows and dealing with DAs and prolapses and such. So they have a, a busy lifestyle. But um, a lot of them have never had this kind of training. So I've been taking my portable teaching parlor around and setting up in uh, dealers' Uh, shops, and it's been fun to work with them and get them comfortable on some of these basic NMC tests. And so um, it's, it's been, been a, a good experience, and I think there's more of this that we need to do. <clears throat> so that's, that's the fundamentals right there of, of some of the comments I want to make. Um, I think we can move into the Q&A now and uh, get a little bit of a late start, so I don't want to run too long here. Uh, who's doing the Q&A? Kathy? Yeah, thanks a lot, Roger. That was a lot of good information. We appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, the first question that's been typed in is, um, could you give some alternative methods that milkers should use when trying to help a cow that is more difficult to milk out than others? You mentioned not waiting the machine um, for obvious reasons, but some cows still seem to still develop mastitis without that intervention. Yeah, so getting... Getting uh, a complete and uniform milk out of a cow, right? So maybe there's some damage to a teat end, um, some conformational issues that, that that a given quarter isn't milking out well. Um, I know, and you know, let's let's be very honest on this statement: on smaller farms where where we aren't rushed for throughput in the parlor, there's there's still opportunity to individually milk a quarter on a slow milking cow to get her completely milked out, to reduce the risk of mastitis, and, and keep her in the herd, that's great. We have the other parlors where speed is just so much a part of what we're looking on, throughput, throughput, throughput. And on those, in those parlors, um, the, a, a cow like that, um, she will just have to be left to her own opportunities to stay healthy and be milked out the best she can because nobody's going to go back and, and carefully pull down on one unit, one cup, to get a slow milking quarter out, I, am, I don't. I don't mean to be harsh, but that's just not what what's going on. And um, and so then that cow probably won't survive. Okay, uh, we have another question. How do you assess if cows are milked out too dry or too wet? Yeah, I see Dr. Gudebach sent that one in. Um, so my favorite, uh, my favorite event to do when I go in a parlor. I just like to go in and quietly watch what's going on before I get any test equipment out. 
I get a milker glove on both hands, and I want to do strip yield tests. The strip yield test, to me, I used to think, what does this really mean? But I've come to really, really respect what I can learn from coming in to do a strip yield test. So that unit comes off, you step up to that cow, and you observe the color of the teeth skin. You can look at teat ends to see if they're smooth or rough. <clears throat> and then I, I want to see how much milk is left in all functional quarters. And I used to measure it in a measuring cup, and I used to try to figure out 100 or 200 cc's, three to four to six ounces combined from all quarters. And anymore, I've, I've gotten comfortable with I'm going to find one of three results. I'm going to find cows that are really dry. The unit comes off, and you strip, do a strip yield, and you get maybe a score, probably nothing, not enough to put in a cup of coffee uh, from all functional quarters. To me, that's a dry cow. Then I'm going to find the herds where I get three or four squirts, six or eight squirts, seven or 12 squirts from all functional quarters, and then they're comfortably dry. And by this, you know, they're synthesizing milk all the time, so they're never, ever really done making milk. But you can tell when you're done. You can tell when the teat cistern and the gland cistern is comfortably empty of milk. And if I can get several squirts from all functional quarters, I'm, I'm saying, good, that's cool, that's great. Dr. Reinemann is telling us that, you know, wetter is better. And we're doing a national study on this for 20 years that we've been milking cows wetter, and, we, and the national cell count continues to drop. Well, some of that, yeah, is, is probably true that we're doing uh, a, a more general th uh, job on the cow's teats. The third thing I see on my strip yields is I'll find a quarter, maybe two, but typically one quarter, that's really, really wet. It's got a lot of milk left in. Now, Dr. Reinemann suggests that he wants three quarters that are pretty dry, and he'd like one quarter, that last quarter, to milk out with maybe 100 cc. Now, with the robotic milkers that we have now, the Lely's and the, the De La Valle VFDs and all the other ones, it's, I think, really amazing to see when you milk cows by the quarter and you can do lactographs by the quarter, you can see that, wow, on the same cow, each quarter milks can milk out quite different than, than the other three quarters in, on the same gland. And we were typically operating on assumption probably the fronts are similar, the backs are, are similar, or maybe they're all really close, but the variation is amazing. So Reinemann's comments are probably legitimate that in any given cow, we're probably going to end up with one quarter a little wetter than the others. That said, what I'm set, what I don't want to see is one quarter that's really wet, that I I have trouble really getting all the milk out. Uh, it's a quart, it's two quarts, it's a lot of milk left in there, but you visually can see that that quarter is not milked out. Whether the strip yield says, man, there's a lot of milk left in here. Well, this is what I asked Reinemann, how much is too much? Because I keep telling people, I, don't, I want that milk sold. I don't want you to send that milk back to the pen. You want to sell it today. And so um, typically the, the wet quarter to me is one of two things. It's a unalignment issue or it's an issue of ringing. I've got, uh, I've got, a, I've got a, a liner that is getting a lot of issues of ringing, and that teeth had a lot of ringing at the mouthpiece. The annular ring would swell. The second two minutes of the milk out experience, that annular ring got enough blood congestion that it really almost closed or did close, and the milk flow stopped, unit came off. But when you step up there to strip yield, all of a sudden, whoo, unit's off, the annular ring separates again, and there was a lot of milk in the gland cistern that came rolling down into the teeth. That's what I think I see on some of these barns with liners that are ringing or unit alignment issues. Those are the big things. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question, is it necessary to check the differing vacuum maximum level between the milking side and pulsated side of the unit? Uh, the maximum, I'm reading the question. I want to make sure I understand what, what Bill's really asking here. Is it necessary to check the differing vacuum max level between the milking side and the pulsated side of the unit? Of the unit, are you talking about the milking unit itself? Or are we talking about uh, the system where we've got the, the vacuum level and the pulsators, the pulsator line vacuum versus the claw, the claw vacuum level? See, Bill is typing uh, some additional question here, so I think um, I'll wait for his additional nuggets here so I can try to answer better. Check the different vacuum. Can't really answer it. I'm okay. I'm checking system. Back in level at the claw, here between the pulsated side, the pulsated side, and the milking side. At the 
far. What the difference between the pulsated side and the milking side? I just need to, to appreciate what, where you're checking it at from the standpoint of a pulsated side and the milking side. I'm trying to think what you're meaning by that. Yeah, looks like he's going to type in some more yeah, clarification cool. for you. Yeah, I just need to know where we're at on that. So there's a max and min with a dry scan. You can get a max and min in the claw vacuum, and then, then you get the average. So we're always talking about the average when we're comparing notes to set a par. Um, the level of the system vacuum really is irrelevant. We want to know what the claw vacuum is. Check in the claw as close to the T as possible between the shell. Oh, in the short, in the short milk tube. Yeah, check in the claw as close to the T as possible. And between the, oh, between the shell and the inflation. Oh. So are you using a Vadia? Is this what you're using on this? Because there's a new piece of equipment that has come out of Europe the last couple of years. I haven't bought one yet, but I'm going to. And um, it gives you the ability to uh, check vacuum levels uh, at four different points on a shell. You can tape this gadget to the shell, and you can check mouthpiece vacuum. You can check short pulsation vacuum. It's possible to inflation. Something I made myself years ago. Oh. Oh, so there's always been a discussion as to where do we check the, the vacuum and what the, the cow really feels. The NFC standard has been the check the claw vacuum, so we're going to use a 12-gauge needle. We're going to go in through the, the uh, short milk tube uh, of the liner and put that, that needle right into the roof of the, of the, uh, the claw, and that was, that's our claw vacuum. Now, you can use a small needle and check. Uh, in the short milk tube way up at the base of the shell. And I've done those. I've run those before, uh, both channels at the same time on my tri-scan. And um, there, there is a little more fluctuation. You can see some more fluctuation in that short milk tube uh, closer to the um, teeth up, up by the shell. Um, there's definitely, unless, you, unless you're using a liner that has the vent piece above the teeth end, that would be the mouthpiece on a liner, unless you're using that liner. There's always been a reverse pressure gradient taking place inside of the short milk tube and the bottom part of the liner where you've got retrograde milk flow. This is where we've always talked about the particles, the droplets of milk flying upwards. And so that, that's going on all the time. The goal is less than a quarter of an inch between max level for these two points. I actually have paws made with ports. Oh, that would be cool. So between, yeah, between those two points, um, to have minimal max, minimal vacuum would be important. But now I've got to come back, Bill, and tell you that everything that Dr. Reinemann is talking about on some of these fluctuation issues, such as I've, I've got a friend that used a body up on, on, a, on a claw liner combination, and on a heavy milking herd, he was seeing uh, fluctuations from the claw up to the short milk tube of maybe up to three and three and a half inches between those two at the same time. And I talked to Reinemann about that, and, and Dr. Reinemann said, yeah, he said, I'm not surprised. There's a lot of turbulence going on in that short milk tube from the end of the teeth down into the claw. But he said, I still don't think that's much of a risk for mastitis. There's other bigger fish to fry, or there's other more important issues. So, so I like your analysis here, and I would say that, that having minimal fluctuation at any point is, is really a good thing. But now it's being called into question, is it giving us a lot of risk for mastitis? even if we had a little bit more fluctuation than that. I'm kind of reporting on where the argument is and not reporting to you that we have a solid conclusion that one is good or one is bad. That's what I can say on that one right now, Kathy. Okay, thank you. Um, looks like Bill's typing something else in. I don't know. I don't see anybody else right, um, sending. Agree with this point. I'm concerned the opening and closing of the inflation. The A and C phase. The other thing I didn't mention, but the other new test that, that was presented a year ago at the NMC, and maybe you saw this, Bill, is, it, is you checking the overpressure of the liner. The overpressure of the liner is, we always know that the liner has a touch point. The liner has a touch point where um, it comes to, down against the teeth in the C phase where it stops milk flow. And then we've always known that there's some extra pinch, some extra massage, some extra pressure that liner's going to put on the teeth. The amount of that pinch has to do with the level of vacuum that's inside the liner. 
and also it has to do with the engineering of the liner, the tension, the thickness of the material, all those other components of the liner itself. So uh, there's data out now that would tell us that these, this overpressure measurement uh, is ideally good at about four inches of vacuum. That's the amount of pinch that the liner's putting on the tea end. That's helpful. That gives us some massage, gets the blood pushed back up into the tea, into the putter. And that if it gets up to seven, overpressures of six, seven, and eight inches is enough extra pinch. That's enough pinch that we're going to actually stimulate some hyperkeratosis by the liner pinch itself. So the inflation opening closing is a big deal. It is part of this comfort and discomfort issue that has a lot to do with the risk of clinical mastitis that's now being talked about. So I agree with you on the um, how the liner opens and closes and is it doing it in a comfortable manner or not. And um, and that we need some overpressure. We need three, four, five inches of overpressure. That's good for massage. Six, seven, and eight inches is suggested too much. And I, every once in a while, I'll see an overpressure. You can check that by pulling the short pulsation tube off the shell, off the nipple on the shell. That lets fresh air in. That means the liner should pinch, uh, will shut on the teeth, and it should stop milk flow from coming into the claw. You can look down at, at the, the window of the claw and see if there's milk coming out of that ferrule into the claw from that teeth. Sometimes if we don't have enough overpressure, the milk never stops coming if the vacuum, system vacuum is too low or the claw vacuum. That's a problem. Now we really don't have any effective massage. So there's some things going on out in, the, in, in my area that I'm traveling in that I'm concerned about. Okay. This All is right. I so, these. Yep. I agree, yep. With, I agree with you on it, Bill. Yeah. That, so, that line of function is really important. And I think we're getting more information here the last couple of years on how to look at that and its impact on cows and risk of mastitis. That's it, Kathy. Okay. Great. It looks like we've uh, handled our questions, and um, so I, again, Roger, thank you very much for your time today and information that you've shared with us. And I want to thank the participant or the uh, participants today too, and appreciate your patience with us as we handled our uh, technical difficulties there at the beginning of the webinar.